Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Um, as uh, you've seen already, I work at the Department of Radiation Oncology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Uh, currently, our department has about 200 staff, 30 physicists, and 30 physicians. Uh, I am part, and the work I'm presenting today is part of the Computational Medical Physics Group. Um, and uh, I would like to spend a little bit of time first in introducing the problem, like uh, background. I know the, the, your uh, background is a bit a little different than uh, what we're trying to do. Um, so in radiation oncology, we obviously, we treat cancer patients. Uh, currently, every year, there is about uh, 17 million new cancer cases worldwide. Out of those, there are about like 3 to 5 million are treated with uh, radiation therapy every year. Uh, I'm focused today in uh, a certain modality called proton therapy, where you use proton beam versus the standard X-ray. And uh, for proton therapy, it's a little bit of a computationally intensive and hard problem to technically to, uh, to solve, and I'll show you that in a bit. Um, but to give you an idea, uh, protons are used to uh, treat different kinds of cancers in different body sites, including the head and neck, the lung, prostate, uh, brain and breast uh, cancers, and most importantly, the pediatric patients, because just of their anatomy is different, and protons are excellent modality for them. Um, to give you a bit of uh, information how radiation works, how radiation therapy works, what we do is we target the DNA structure of the cancer cells with a very high uh, energetic beam, uh, this destructs the DNA uh, by some mechanisms, and that leads to the cell kill of the cancer cells. Um, unfortunately, that works for, for both uh, the cancer cells and for the healthy tissue around it. And usually, people get cancer in deep seated, like inside your body, and there is always a residual dose that goes through the healthy tissue. The whole problem we're facing is to introduce this radiation to the cancer cells, the tumors, without harming the other healthy tissue surrounding it. Uh, so protons are usually produced with high energy uh, particle accelerators like synchrotrons like this, where uh, 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 they are being accelerated to high energy and transported through a gantry uh, into the table where the patient will lay down. Uh, like this, and then this gantry has a robotic motion which goes around in almost 360 degrees to target the tumor from different angle. Um, so I borrowed this figure. I found it very nice and weird to have uh, wired. <laughs> I mean, I have a very nice uh, diagram for showing this. So this uh, gives you a detail, sorry, gives you a detail of how the radiation therapy works. So you have the particles being generated and accelerated here delivered through uh, what we call a gantry uh, that moves around the patient in uh, 360 degrees. Um, what we care about here, why we have the, I have this slide up here, is to tell you, like, in this kind of settings, we, as uh, in, uh, in radiation therapy, we treat uh, every patient with uh, their own plan. We have different anatomy, different tumor sizes and volumes in and, and different places. So every patient comes in being imaged and a treatment plan generic to this patient, I'm um, sorry, uh, very specific to this patient uh, being uh, generated um, uh, in a daily basis. Um, so there are control variables for those treatment plans. They include beam energies and beam directions. So in this case, for example, uh, we can have up to different 100 possibilities and uh, 360 different angles to choose from. Uh, once you get closer to the, to the tumor, then you have more choices. We can uh, uh, direct this uh, proton beam to different spots on the tumor volume until we cover the whole volume with the, uh, with the irrigation to kill the cancer cells inside here. Uh, so this adds a lot of more uh, possibilities and adds to the problem that we're trying to solve. So now we have 10 to the fifth different variables in addition to the ones that I mentioned, and you can do all the combination and the math to figure out how many possibilities are there. Uh, and for a given patient, uh, for example, here there is a, this is a, a out of a CT image of uh, a patient with a brain tumor. Uh, 
uh, you can see the brain tumor is a uh, little bit deep inside and uh, surrounded by healthy tissue. So you have the optic nerve, the optic chasm, uh, different parts of the brain that's surrounding this tumor. And there is no way to deliver radiation without going through those or without putting some dose. And the whole idea is trying to figure out what are the trade-offs that we can achieve uh, uh, using machine learning in order to find the best way to deliver this radiation without harming the patient. So if you add to those two sets of variables, we have a bigger problem now to solve. So you have your control variables, uh, the 10 to the 2 different uh, beam, beam energies, the beam directions, and the positions where you're going to put those uh, spots. In addition to that, once we try to figure those out, there are not only one objective, there are a set of objectives. If each objective uh, we need to meet uh, has to have a kind of a range of values that uh, means a lot different uh, aspects of the patient health after the treatment. Um, so for the, for the tumor, obviously, you would like to deliver as much radiation as possible to kill the, the, the cancer cells. But for the healthy organs around it, different organs have different tolerances. And the way we, to live, uh, we, we can, uh, uh, as human beings, we can tolerate uh, radiation is also a little bit different based on the history of the patient. Uh, so our job is to achieve those objectives, to maximize the tumor radiation to the tumor minimize radiation to different organs that, that's around it, and understand the trade-offs between those two for every single patient. Uh, so what happens in, in the clinic once the patient gets in, there's a team of the uh, physician, the physicist, and the dosimetrist. They sit together. They try to come up with a treatment plan for every single patient. Um, so the process goes that uh, you have uh, the patient comes in. There's an imaging that happens. Uh, once the image uh, gets in, there is a computational uh, aspect that has to happen to, in order to kind of uh, find out uh, what do we need uh, to, uh, to radiate. Um, and then after that, we have to set those parameters, especially the beam energies, the directions, and all that. Um, and so that's the hard part because there is an iteration here where we go into uh, selection mode, we select a uh, first set of parameters, uh, we go into computational uh, side where we uh, simulate this uh, parameters, and after that, we evaluate uh, those parameters, how they impact the output or the outcomes in this case. So we go th through this iteration several times, and. Uh, um, just like uh, by analogy f uh, for data scientist, as you sit to model uh, or f uh, fine tune your uh, hyperparameters, that's what actually happens. We are sitting there trying to fine tune those parameters. Uh, but then you have a patient waiting to be treated. Uh, so the usual, uh, this usual process takes about a week for a single patient. And the problem is we have uh, about 20 different patients every single day. Uh, we run our proton center uh, uh, two shifts a day, uh, so there is no point. And then there is a maintenance time and downtime, so um, that's why we are kind of like pushing our limits here in order of uh, the treatment planning process. Uh, so what this means under the hood, technically speaking, is that we are having um, a large scale multi objective optimization problem where we would like to minimize a set of functions. Um, and each set of functions represent either the dose to the target or dose to different healthy organ. And when I say dose, this means like amount of energy that you hit the, the, the cells. So usually uh, you can set your initial parameters and solve this large scale. Uh, problem using a trade method like uh, conjugate gradient or BFGS. Um, but then you have already chosen your initial parameters, and you don't know what the output result looks like. Um, and that's the whole trade-off part here. Uh, so the output objectives are highly dependent and nonlinear function of the initial parameters, and it's different for every different patient. Um, and the way they are picked now is picked 
They are picked based on user experience, uh, which is mainly the dosimetrist sitting there by knowing how the patient anatomy looks like. We have seen hundreds of patients before, so they come up with the initial parameters that they think that's close that would get them to the objectives that they want. Uh, once they do that, we go into calculation mode and that takes about 10 to 30 minutes, and after that, um, they have to reiterate. And this usually takes about a week. Um, so what we're trying to automate here is to switch the treatment planning process from a manual iterations where we look at uh, single objective optimizations into multi-objective optimizations. Um, so uh, we do that by switching to Pareto-based planning, uh, which is basically um, uh, uh, is a concept that solves the problem of the best practice for multi-objective optimization. And it, it tells you the best way to solve it is to generate this Pareto surfaces uh, that tells you that all the points in those surface are the ultimate dominant points in your objective space. Uh, so in the simple words, what you do is you construct those uh, uh, plots, which tells you you put different objectives. This is the, uh, how much tumor dose you are uh, putting into the uh, tumor. This is how much energy or dose you're putting to the healthy organ. The best point ever in this plot is to be here where you maximize your uh, tumor dose and almost zero health tissue. But that, that doesn't happen, and that's where the trade-off curves comes in play here. So you construct this curve, you select a point based on uh, different uh, criteria for the patient. Um, but then once you do this, you think about it, you have two objectives. In reality, we have more than 20 to 30 different objectives. So if I just plot a random 3D plot that tells you like it's really hard to navigate such uh, a curve. Um, uh, and that's kind of uh, one thing that we're trying to solve as well with machine learning. Um, so as I mentioned, the advantage of this approach is it gives you full information on the objective values and uh, trade-offs between them. It shows you how improving one objective is related to deteriorating the other objectives. Uh, the challenges here, it's competitionally expensive to calculate those Pareto surfaces for every patient. Second, it's hard to visualize and navigate as uh, the example I'm showing here. To put this in a concept, during the treatment planning process, what happens is that you have uh, some variable, the machine variables. Here, machine means the radiation machine. And you have your objectives or the outputs here. And every time the, uh, the treatment planner tries to tweak the initial parameters, they are moving along those curves here. At the end, they generate few, uh, few here means less than 10 plans and choose one of them uh, based on what they think is the best trade-off just out of 10. Uh, the new paradigm is that we would like to generate those Pareto surfaces for, for the treatment planner. So instead of looking at few points, you're looking at the whole trade-off spectrum of plans and taking uh, decisions based on that. Um, so the goal of this project is to have, uh, uh, at the end, high quality treatment plans in a very short uh, planning time. Um, so that's where automation comes in place. So what we're doing, we are uh, kind of generating an automated way of generating those Pareto surfaces and populating them for the treatment planner so that they don't have to sit there, tweak parameter by parameter uh, uh, for every single patient. Um, and how we do that, we kind of uh, build the models to predict the correlation between those objectives and also between the objectives and the initial parameters that are put in into this optimization process. Once we build these models, um, after that, the treatment planner will come. Uh, it's a kind of a th a competition run that will, will be sent overnight, and then they come in the morning. They have all the possible uh, planning options available for them and they can pick out of them, or they can use the model to generate plans that were not generated for them, and this will take the process from a week running into a few hours. 
So now the new process is much shorter. So you have an imaging uh, computational task where everything is being put in a GPU cluster uh, where you have automated generation of the multi criteria plans. And then here I'm showing like a few examples of what this can calculate. Uh, and after that, uh, you have the machine learning aided evaluation of those multi objective space. This will reduce the time from a week to a few hours of running and evaluation afterwards. Uh, so what happens uh, in those calculations is that you start with, uh, we start with using uh, differential evolution to generate few plans uh, by looking into those initial parameters. Uh, and after generating them, we use uh, random forest to predict correlations for every patient between the objectives and the objectives uh, and their initial parameters that generated them. Once we do this, we'll be able to generate a whole uh, set of uh, Pareto uh, surface like this. Uh, so this is done in two phases. The first phase is the construction of the Pareto surface as I just described, where you have the guided generation of the Pareto plans. Um, and this is done in a parallel computing environment to speed up the whole process. The second phase is a navigation phase where the treatment planner will sit and they have access to, the, to those database and are linked to the uh, uh, computational uh, cluster as well, where every time they would like to generate a plan, they just uh, select a point in the spray to surface and uh, models are used to uh, predict how to generate those plans and generate it for them uh, on the fly. Uh, so we implemented this in a multi-node, multi-GPU cluster. Initially, we did the initial testing on uh, 24 different GPUs with four different uh, nodes. Um, so we had uh, fast InfiniBand communication between them, and implementation was done uh, with MPI. So everything was done in Python with MPI. Uh, we were able to do a good sampling of the Pareto surface in under three hours, depending on the patient volume that we are treating. Um, and as I mentioned, we use differential evolution and random force for this generation phase. Uh, right now, we're working in deploying this into our production cluster. So we have a uh, 42 computing node where um, each node has four Tesla K80 GPUs. Um, uh, with uh, 48 different CPUs. Uh, this is where we're using s only for the proton therapy. Um, so we're kind of putting a lot of computational power behind this in order to achieve our goals of reducing the time and uh, improve the quality. Okay, so now to the fun part. So I'm gonna show today two patients that we uh, uh, looked at, uh, at them and we compared as testing uh, cases, uh, of, we compare the manual iterative process versus the automated way with using this MCO, uh, which uh, multi criteria optimization. Um, so in this case here, we have a patient with uh, what we call a head and neck cancer. So they have a treatment. They have uh, treatment sites in both sides of the neck, and you can see here in the cross sections the contours in blue and red. Those are the uh, regions that we need to radiate. Anything else in those images are healthy tissue and we need to spare. For example, here you can see the spinal cord inside the vertebral body and here in the middle. Uh, so if you, there is no way to uh, radiate those regions that are highlighted without putting radiation in some of the organs at risk. We have lots of them, so we have here in this case, you have the mandibles, the submandible glands, the esophagus, uh, the parotid, the oral cavity. You have lots of organs, at, uh, we call it organs at risk, means organs that are at risk of failure. Um, it's hard choices to make here, because you're telling a patient, we're gonna kill the cancer, but at the same time, there's something that, some function you're gonna lose, and that's, uh, the trade-off that we are looking at. Um, so here I'm doing a comparison between the uh, manually iterated plan and the automated, automated one. So the manual plan here, I'm showing uh, the CT cross-sections in a sagittal coronal view and the cross-sectional view. The colors represent the how much energy being deposited at every pixel here. Uh, 
Red is good for tumor, bad for healthy tissue. Blue is good for healthy tissue and bad for tumor. Red means more energy deposited there, and that's what we want. Blue means a small amount of energy being deposited, and we would like to spare the healthy tissue. So we would like to see no red at all around the spinal cord, for example. Because you radiate the spinal cord, the patient loses feelings, <laughs> loses the whole uh, control for their uh, rest of the body. So here, uh, I'm showing a manually generated plan versus the automated generated plan. I'm highlighting where the differences are. So you can see there's a little bit of radiation creeping in in the spinal cord here. We're able to spare a lot in the automated plan. And in the sagittal and coronal view, you can kind of say uh, that we were able to achieve uh, a lot better uh, of a result, especially for the spinal cord. So we put this in numbers, and we look here. Those bars represent how much dose did we uh, save by doing the automated plan, or how much uh, energy we were able to uh, reduce. Uh, so the longer the bar is, the better the automated plan is. And for different organs that are surrounding uh, this area that we're treating. So here, uh, you can see there's a lot of organs that uh, would have uh, much smaller, uh, smaller energy being uh, deposited. Some of them, eh, the changes was not that uh, different. Um, but that's the beauty of it. This thing took about a few hours of running in a cluster. Nobody's doing anything. The other one is a human sitting there in a computer, just like uh, you know when you do the uh, tuning, the, you do send a new set of parameters, you go get a cup of coffee and come again for a week, doing this over and over for a week. Uh, the second case is a pediatric uh, case, means there's a child. Uh, and the same concept about the colors, the red is good, the blue is, uh, the red is go good for the tumor, the blue is bad for the tumor, and vice versa for healthy tissue. Uh, in this case, it, uh, it's much, much smaller volume, um, but then you have a very critical structures next to the uh, volume we're treating. This, this kid had a, a cancer in the eye, and um, you can see around it, there is the optic nerve, there is the lacrimals, uh, the retina, the other eye. So we'd like to spare all those so that they can have a healthy life after the treatment. Um, here is uh, this here. That's the manually generated plan. In this case, that's the automated generated plan. It's a little bit hard to see a huge difference, but at least you can see that for the optic nerve and uh, the retina. Um, and if you look at the numbers, we're able to achieve as good or better than a human-generated plan in a week. So uh, finally, after generating those plans, that's what goes to the physician, a trade of curves like those. Those are Pareto curves for those real patients where they go through all those points and say, well, this is one of the uh, objectives This is versus the other. And uh, in order to make it easy to navigate, we have the third objective as a color. Uh, so the physician or treatment planner would go after generating all those automated plans and look at them and make decisions based in the whole surface that they can see, not only one or, f or 10 points that were generated for them before. You can do this for lots of organs at risk. And uh, when we looked at uh, those treatment plans versus what we predicted, we were able to achieve uh, really good uh, predictions. So here is the uh, objectives versus the same values, but from prediction for, different, for three different objectives, the oral cavity, the nasal, nasal cavity, and the right parotid. Um, so right now, we're exploring putting this in uh, Jupiter for uh, interactive uh, um, uh, navigation, so the physician will have access to this, or the dosimetrist, depending who's going to end up uh, spending more, most of the time looking at those, those plans. Um, but the idea here is that we are able to see correlations that we're not able to see before, because uh, when someone is doing the iterative work manually, uh, a lot of the processes and the data is not collected behind the scenes. Uh, 
so I'd like to conclude that we were able to achieve a really good uh, models and uh, generate Pareto plans for automatic generation of treatment plans for testing patients. And right now we're still uh, looking into how to deploy this into the clinic. The algorithm we Im implemented and everything was done with uh, Python and CUDA. Uh, obviously I mentioned we do GPU, all the intensive calculations are done uh, using uh, uh, the GPUs and the CPUs are there for <laughs> data transfers. Uh, we were able to achieve improvement of deliverable plans in a time efficient manner and we're working now in doing the uh, navigation and visualization in Jupyter, especially we're looking into the 3D visualizations. Um, and this is something that uh, I think it's uh, very important, not just for us as Mayo Clinic, but also for everyone else, especially in developing countries. Right now, those protein centers are being built in a lot of developing countries. and. Uh, one thing you would face there is that uh, the staffing and the training and the resources you put into the treatment planning is hard to achieve there. And that's something that uh, might help in this regard. And so instead of uh, having to train, train different, you know, 30 or 50 different physicians and dosimetrists and physicists in order to do this, you can have something that's running automated that gives you a plan and you give those patients, especially the pediatric patients, a good chance in life uh, and, you know, remove this dependency of the training of the staff. So I'm done. Uh, I'm open to questions and also for your input as well. If you have any interesting ideas, here's my email. Please come talk to me uh, after, I'm after the talk. Thank you. <laughs>